human beings are storytellers. I, I mean, that's just who we are. We're storytellers, we're, we're consumers of stories, period. That's the power of storytelling. It's not just for entertainment. I want people to think. I put the characters in situations. I want the reader to go, what would I do? Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. I'm your host, Nikki Baloo. And boy, do we have an amazing guest lined up for you today. Today's guest is a repeat guest. He's one of my favorite guests of all time. He is a best-selling author of some absolutely incredible books in the genre of the post-apocalyptic thriller book. I love what this man's all about. I love the books that he's written, and he's written one of the most famous poems of all time. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the one, the only, the legendary <laughs> G. Michael Hopp. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Hey, hey. It's always great to be here. Thank you always for the opportunity to sit down and talk with you. You're a good human being, my man. A good man. Thank you very much. God bless your heart for saying that, man. God bless your heart. So, brother, you got a new book out. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Why are you so excited about yeah. it? Because it uh, looks pretty cool. It, it, it is pretty cool. Um uh, it's my first uh, post-apocalyptic novel in three years. And on top of it, it's more importantly, it's my 40th book in my career. Wow. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. Yeah, book number 40. Um, yeah, it's called Cries of a Dying World. It's a standalone apocalyptic novel that really follows kind of a cast of characters as they're kind of coming to grips with the reality of their own demise. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Um, and, you know, eh, not to be maudlin or anything, but just given the world that we've been living in the last couple of years, <laughs> you know, <laughs> writing a, a, a new book with this theme and in this genre is definitely got to be something that's going to catch a lot of people's attention. It's going to capture their imagination. Um, what made you decide to come back to this work and to write this book? Um, it's been a while, you know, and as a writer, you're a writer yourself, you know, that, um, you kind of get itches and, you know, after having 39 books and which I put out in about 10 years, got yeah, a little burned out, I could say, you know, I kind of jumped genres as well and went from post-apocalyptic fiction, did some Westerns and then uh, did some kind of dabbled in that, you know, the paranormal with my business partner, Shannon McGraw, um, and then it was just over the summer, man. I had an interesting year last year, but then over the summer, I just had this itch is really, really growing in me that I needed to get back at it, that I'd taken enough time off from really building worlds and writing that I just needed to get, I just needed to get back at it. And being that it was going to be my 40th book, I wanted it to be something special. I will say that I'd had, I would, this is you and I were kind of chatting a little bit before and um, there I had written about 40,000 words and this come fall, I went to dinner with some friends and uh, a friend of mine who's also an author and she's a pastor at our church mentioned like, Jeff, you know, this is book number 40. So this is pretty significant. You know, 40 is a holy number, blah, 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 blah. That really hit me. And I went home and I let that marinate on my brain. I woke up and I'm like, this book is book number 40. This is going to be a special book. And Am I giving it justice? Am I just writing like I normally write? And I don't want to have this sound, I don't know, like egotistical in regard, but you know, when you've written 40 books, writing can kind of just come to you, right? You know, there's not, I don't really experience writer's block. I was like, am I just, just rehashing kind of old stuff? And so I was like, you know, I really want to stretch on this one. I really want this book as I'm writing it to be uncomfortable in my writing. Uh, and so I just trashed, it was like almost 40,000 words, like 38,000, 39,000 words. I just got rid of them. When I say I got rid of them, I, I saved them or somewhere my computer saved, but um, I just started all over again. And it, it when I did that, it, it was interesting, like everything freed up in my brain and the story just kind of evolved. And it's a beautiful story. It's really, it's, it's truly, a story about people about the character of a human being, like the, like the event that's about to befall these people. It's an asteroid that's coming toward the planet is really just a, 
a storytelling device that's being used to get characters to move, to get them to do something. It's not really even about the asteroid Colossus. It's about what happens to people. Who are you as a person when you know your existence has an expiration date on it, that you know for sure you only have 14 more sunrises and sunsets? That's it. What do you do with those last 14 days? How do you conduct yourself? Who are you as a human being? That's really the central focus of this book. You know, that's really wild. I remember in the late 90s, there were a couple of movies. And for whatever reason, their names are escaping me right now. One of them was with Bruce Willis. The other one was with Morgan Freeman. And the yeah. stories were about asteroids that were hitting the Earth, right? And, and yeah. there were some yeah. very powerful um personal story backdrops in each movie and about how the folks were dealing with um what was about to happen right and there was a there was a couple of folks in the movie that bruce willis was in that said that okay we're, we're gonna go try to stop this asteroid but we have some demands from the government the government's going okay yeah what what are your demands well first and foremost we don't ever want to pay any taxes of any kind ever right they go be done. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> was, Armageddon. Yeah, that was, was a great Bruce movie. By the movie. Way. Told, yeah, it was Armageddon. I'm trying to think of the other one. Um, but yeah, the what's where that was definitely more of an action kind of Armageddon was more of an action drama. And this is I, I wanted to give mankind an extinction level event that was truly an extinction level event. Like once this thing hits and do my research. Um, on asteroid or comet impacts, uh, what if one is a significant size, it will literally destroy the Earth, not like break it into pieces, but the searing heat from the ejecta cloud and 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 just the 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 the, the blanket of cl the cloud cover that will cover the Earth within hours will just bake and sear the planet's surface. And so nothing on the surface will survive, period. So I wanted an event where essentially everything dies. And th and there's only kind of one escape plan and that are this, this, some of these government bunkers that have been uh, uh, constructed. But uh, other than that, the vast majority of people are having to come to grips with them dying and then really dealing with regrets they might have had in their life people questioning you know uh who they are and a lot of people are coming closer to god some people are not some people are just acting out in violence and so again it's just really a it's a character driven book that just really dives into you know what happens when we're faced with such a hard fact and what this is what's interesting nikki is that is we already know we're all going to die right now we all know one day we're going to die we just don't know when that day is. So we go about it acting the way we do um, without thinking or kind of maybe blocking it out or dismissing that it could literally be tomorrow, right? Deep and impact. So because that was the other movie with deep, Morgan Freeman. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And so, but what happens when you're literally given a day? You're actually given a day. There's no doubt about it. There's no deviation from that day. Like you will expire on this day at this specific time then you only got so many days so many sunrises so many sun your life what are, and what does that life mean to you who are you you know and i think it i think people you really will show themselves in those in those final moments you know what that's very very true and i remember in those two movies people were showing themselves in the final moments and there's something that you know, my father used to say to me, and he said, son, it's incredible, but human beings are often at their best when things are at their worst. And they're often at their worst yep. when things are at their best. <laughs> you know, that's crazy, but I, I, I find that to be true. Yeah. yeah, it's so true. Like, you know, you start to really think about what's important in your life. And then you instantly, it's, 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 it's amazing. Well, there's always the cliche thing when someone's sitting on their deathbed, do they really think about their jobs anymore? No, they think about what is consistently the most important things in life. That is family, friends, love. Those are the central 
themes or parts of their lives that people are, are more drawn towards when they know their death is imminent. And so why don't we hold on to that through everyday life? I don't know why God designed us the way he did, but we do. We, we get caught up in like the cat looking at the red dot and looking at all these other things and not really focusing on what's actually important and what we find important when we're only given so many hours or days or weeks left to live. Yeah, amen, man. I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, I love your books because your books are entertaining to be sure. But what I really love about your books is that your books touch me as the reader in the deepest recesses of my soul. They bring out a part of me that allows me in that moment to join with the world that you've created and, and to imagine that I'm living the best version of my life through that story, you know, and that's a powerful thing. That's a very, very powerful thing. Um, I remember your book, the end, which is one of the best books I've ever read in, in the fiction <laughs> genre did such a powerful job of that. And when I read that, I was like, wow, Man, I could see this happening. I could see myself being a part of a world like this. And I just wondered mm -hmm. to myself, would I be able to step up as a man, as a father, in the same way that the title character in the, in, in the book did? Uh, would I be able to protect my family and the people that I love? And it just, it made me feel better about humanity to read such a book. I don't know if I'm sounding mm. crazy to you or not, but that's what the best books do for me is they elevate my soul, they elevate my view of humanity, and they make me strive to be a better man and a better human being. Yeah. I mean, if someone, I, I feel honored that you said those words, that, that means a lot, by the way. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. I think if, when it comes to art itself, whether it's a painting or, you know, it's, it's the written word, it's a movie, right? If it can move you in a certain way or make you think that then the artist, the, the creator of that has done their job without a doubt. And that's kind of what we're, you know, I've always wanted to not just entertain. I did want people to think, you know, when, you know, when they're reading my books, I want them to, that's why I will put characters and very, untenable or very difficult situations, you know, like in the end specifically, I, I did that a lot with Gordon Van Zandt. You know, I put him in situations. If he goes left, someone dies. If he goes right, someone dies. So if you make a choice, Gordon, because someone's dying, you just have to make sure that it's the right person, you know? And sometimes it's, 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 or, or it's not, it, it's just always difficult situations that he just has to make choices. And sometimes his choices aren't the best choices because Gordon himself is a human being. He's fallible. And um, yeah, so, and, and Cries of a Dying World really dives even deeper into kind of choices we make as people. Um, there's characters are dealing with their past, choices they made in their past, uh, and the consequences of those. And now they're faced with their own demise. And what do they get to do? Did they get reduced? they be able to make up for mistakes and second chances and things like that. So that's what a lot of these characters are doing in Cries of the Dying World. They're, they're dealing with their own demise, but then also coming to grips with forgiving themselves for their past and then, you know, hopefully kind of paying it forward a little bit before they die. Amen, brother. Amen. I think that's, that's important and powerful. I look at my own life, you know, there, there's, um, there's a lot about my life that I love right now, and there's a few things about my life right now that suck, <laughs> you know, uh, and mm. I'm probably giving a lot more airtime to the things that suck than I ought to be, and I, I'm not giving enough airtime to the things that are amazing uh, in my life, and that's something. Well, there's powerful. there's two things there, there's two things that are, that are happening right there that I can that I can say, um, and I can lean in on that. And that is we should always be looking with gratitude or with gratitude toward the things we do have, because it's very easy. The ego wants to turn toward what's not happening or what's not going right and really amplify that. Right. 
Yeah. So it, it, we, we then look away because remember, wherever we put our focus, our energy goes, right? And so if we yeah. put our energy toward gratitude, then we, we feel better typically. It's hard to kind of stuff in bad stuff when you're filled with just the happiness of all the blessings you do have. Because in reality, we all, we, every human being has at any given time, good times and bad times. And, but most of the, there's a lot of things to be grateful for. But I will add this, and this is a component of the book, Cries of the Dying World. It's a revelation that's really come to me over the past year. And that is there's also embrace the suffering in some ways there's lessons in the suffering and if you look at you know the god himself god never promised that we would never that we wouldn't suffer by the way he never said that we wouldn't suffer and so what do we do when so you, you can be you, you, people can be devout christians and and experience suffering and a lot of them will question god why is this happening to me and what's interesting is if you look at even jesus himself as an individual as a man he went into the wilderness. Well, the, you know, the devil didn't send him into the wilderness. The devil tempted him when he was there. It was the spirit, when you read the Bible, the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, led him in to the wilderness. And in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus suffered as a human being. He was, wasn't was eating. He wasn't, he was kind of, all these things were coming to him because he had the flesh of a man. So he was feeling, feeling that. And so he was suffering. And but so what was happening in that suffering is God was leveling him up because if you if you know the Bible when he leaves the wilderness is essentially when Jesus's ministry begins really yes this is this is when it, that's what kickstarts everything so what that tells me is that sometimes God Himself will allow suffering because there's a lesson for us in that suffering there's we this is where we get to grow we get to level up. If we find if we, if we find the answer in the suffering, the positive answer in the suffering, like the, you know, our our bodies itself thrive to a certain point when it's put under stress, yes. when it's when it suffers, when you when you're working your muscles, right? You're breaking them down, and then they build back up stronger. And I think the soul and the mind can do that when it suffers. Sometimes you just have to find. Why? So uh, there's a question I ask whenever I've gone through moments of suffering, and that is, why am I in the presence of this? Why is this here? Instead of casting blame around and looking around at people or things to cast blame on, I take the ownership of it and like, okay, why am I in the presence of this person or this event? Why is this happening? And how did, was I to blame for putting myself here, here or being in this situation? That's it. Taking ownership of something is a huge growth thing to do, man. And you yeah. might end up in the at the end result to only find five percent of what you did led to whatever's happening. Maybe, but it's still you took the time to examine it and to and to understand your role as a person and why you were there. But I just I think that so often humans, and I can understand it, I've been in this person, like we want comfort. Right. We want we, we want to be comfortable. Right. And who doesn't. Right. But it's in it's in our uncomfortable moments. It's in that suffering where we can find a lot of answers. It's in darkness, by the way, that we can see light. You know, David Goggins talks about this stuff a lot. Yeah. That if you allow yourself, if you allow yourself to be alone and you allow yourself to be alone in darkness, the light will present itself. But you got, but it's it's a journey you have to do alone. Again, going back to when Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus wasn't with anybody. Yes, he had the Holy Spirit there with him, and God was went into the wilderness alone. And so we all have to sometimes have our own wildernesses we have to go into, and we have to do it alone. And um, there's answers there in the wilderness, something that will level you up. Yeah, this is good. I mean, you're making me think right now. As I'm, I've been taking notes from what you've been saying. You know, um, I, I agree with you. Embracing the suffering is where it's where it's at. There, there are lessons in my own suffering, and uh, I also agree that God will sometimes allow suffering. Not sometimes, oftentimes <laughs> allow suffering yeah. because He believes that there are lessons for me in that suffering. Lessons I'm not learning, and that desire for comfort is very, very much a part of 
the makeup of human beings. But, you know, Ed Milet said comfort and greatness cannot coexist. And he's yeah, right. It, it, Ed's completely, he's right, 100%. Like, yeah. Some sometimes it's then when people don't, and we've all gone through this. You, people can lose a job. Sometimes that door's closing on when someone loses a job because there's another door open. But we get too caught in the pain of the event to look around to kind of be present. And why are you in the presence of that situation to see the other door even open? Some people don't see that other door because they're too focused on that on the suffering. When I say when I mean when I mean about kind of leaning into the suffering and it's 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 don't be don't be consumed by it, yeah. but just accept it, kind of lean into it and know that it's there to make you a better person more than likely. And I know, and when I say that the people who are in the midst of suffering, they want to tell me to go pound sand. I understand that. No one. I mean, I get it, but it's there's there's. The suffering is a teacher if you allow it to be. It, it can it'll make you a stronger, harder man. And this is something, by the way, I'd love to talk about men in general. I think I think men are, a, a, as a whole in Western society, are suffering. And it's and it, we want to cast blame at pop culture, how they're casting men and, and uh, kind of political organizations or affiliations that want to demonize men. But the end result is men are allowing it to happen you know yeah. and 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 they, they really are i mean the, the, i don't i'm beyond now casting blame i just look at and whenever something happens i look at myself like what role did i have and what can i do to be to elevate past this to be a better man to to get past all that kind of stuff society needs men needs strong men oh, and i know you're a big proponent you're 100%. a big proponent and advocate for an advocate for men and and men are suffering, but it's in this suffering that men are going through that the answers there. Like you're a leader in this, and I I applaud you for the work you've been Thank doing you. in that. But I think um, we need to really focus on coming in and finding the answers and then and then and then stepping out as strong men. Well, Jeff, I think what I appreciate I appreciate what you said. It means a lot. It really does. And um I I agree with what you're saying. I would love to do this interview with you again in the context of the work with men because I'm putting this particular show on on the Thought Leader Revolution okay. my my business podcast. But you know, when it comes to to men and what men need to do differently in this day and age is I believe that we need to, at a grassroots level, have men gather together and celebrate the virtues of manhood. These virtues are um, keeping your word. You know, keeping your word. <laughs> it is hilarious, but Jeff, people don't keep their freaking word. They just don't. People tell me they're going to do things, okay, all the time. Like, there's a man that I have a lot of love and respect for, and he's part of our men's organization. And I actually think so much of him that I asked him to join a leadership group we've set up called the High Council. And, you know, I believe he's intelligent. I believe he's someone who wants to make a difference for, for humanity and for men in particular. So I asked him to join and he said, yes. And he came to one meeting and then he quit. And, you know, he had good reasons. It was more work than he'd been led to believe, but he didn't say yes to, I'm going to check this out. He said yes to I'm joining. Right. And I can't make him understand that he just shot himself in the foot. Not me, because, you know, I'll find someone else to fill his role. It's not a big deal. But he shot himself in the foot. Because whenever you say, I will do X, to yourself or to another human being, and for whatever reason you don't do X, whatever the reason is, you lose a little bit of your own faith in yourself. Your not trust sure. in you 
goes. So if you said to me, Nikki, I'm going to meet you tomorrow night for dinner at Spago's in LA, and I show up and you don't, and you call me and you go, you know what? Something important came up at work. I will believe you, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll be a little mildly annoyed maybe, but you know, I'll go, yeah, no big deal, whatever. But you, the impact on you will be that your, your faith in you, that, that armor of faith, there's a little chink that you put in there. And people, men in particular, are putting chinks in their armor of faith in themselves every freaking day. And I cannot, I am not perfect at keeping my word. I suck at it, to be perfectly honest. But compared to the average man, I'm a rock star. And I think I suck. And I, I want to be at the level that my father was in terms of how he kept his word. And my grandfather and my uncles, those guys would rather die than not keep their word. They would make commitments to do things. I remember my dad, and he would come to me after, and he'd bellyache about, I should have never said yes to that. But it would never occur to him to back out. Like it would never occur to him to back out. And I want I want to be like my dad was, and I want to convey this to men that if we rebuild men's word in this day and age alone, I think that'll change the world. I, I would agree with that. I would agree with a lot, I mean a lot of what you just said. You know, I I I fall victim to that by overcommitting myself. I like to say yes to things a lot of times. And then I fall victim. Like I really overcommitted myself. Here now. And this is where then I hope that people can have effective communication and, and trying to bridge that. But without a doubt, like if you can't keep the word to your, to, and you can't keep the word to yourself, then who are you going to keep it to? By the way, that's the big thing. So it's when it, so I would take that, I would take that a step further when someone's giving their word to do something outside of themselves. But what's worse is when they give the, they tell themselves, I'm going to do dry January. And then they don't do it. That's the word they've broken to themselves. That's even worse. Now they can't even trust themselves, right? When they say, I, I'm going to not do this or do that. I'm talking just from their own personal growth or personal development, things like that. And they don't, yeah. that if, so you can look at somebody, if somebody says they're going to do something, they proclaim it to the world and then they don't do it, then you know that person probably would break the word with you because they're breaking the word with themselves more. Yeah. And more people, I mean, we are self-interested people. I mean, it's a self-preservation type thing. So if the person's willing to break their own word to themselves, they'll break the word to anybody. Well, I, I have to kind of laugh about this. Is It's like when someone was asking me about... Um, when people were trying to compartmentalize, I'm not, I don't want to dive into politics on this only because it's just a prominent story that happened years ago was when um, you know Bill Clinton got caught with all his little shenanigans going on, right? And it was a really big thing back then. It was really one of them. I mean, we all kind of, always kind of knew Kennedy kind of had his little thing and probably most politicians do of any stripe. But, you know, Bill Clinton's was kind of like the modern version, but it was all like sensational, sex scandal, blah, blah, blah. And I was, I was really prominent in saying at the time, like, listen, we can't trust him at all. And people were trying to say, compartmentalize. Well, no, no, he's just not good. He can't keep his word and be faithful over there. But when it comes to the country, he will. I'm like, no, because that's a test of his character. So if the man is willing to, if the man is willing to do that to someone he said that he loved, he's willing to do it to anybody. You know, yeah, not just word, but keep the vows, keep pledges, keep keep the word of honor you've given to other people. If I make a commitment to somebody and I don't keep it, I'm hurting me. You know, it's bad enough that I'm hurting them and I'm causing uh, some some uh, discomfort or stress to them, but I'm hurting me. And when I make commitments to myself and I break them, and that's the area where I need a, a, to get a lot better than I am right now. That is definitely not good either. But anyways, let's switch topics. Let's digress a little bit. <laughs> so um, I know a lot of people in my line of work that are top level gurus, you know, coaches, speakers, authors, who proudly proclaim that they will never read any fiction. Proudly. 
they are just i read so many books but never any fiction and when i hear that it's my opinion that fiction ennobles the soul fiction teaches us we as human beings learn from stories story has been the Mm -hmm. way in which we have learned from one another throughout history and and there's so many people today that are writing books hey i just wrote my book so thinking that the world's going to think there's some sort of expert and if you don't really have something good to say and you don't have a good way to say it then no you're not an expert (laughs) and the world isn't going to think that of you uh so you know i want to know you know your take on this are these people wrong like i believe they are that you know they should be reading fiction right human beings are storytellers i mean that's just who we are we're storytellers we're, we're consumers of stories period from the even when we're sleeping our subconscious mind is in the process of rehashing problems or going through it and it will give us a story called a dream dreams or stories are playing out in our minds to when we wake to when we go to sleep and during the waking hours, what are we doing? We're either on social media and what's on social media. We're consuming people's stories. I'm not talking about this quote unquote story uh, that's in an Instagram. I'm not talking about in, like social media itself is you're looking at people's lives. You're looking at them projecting a story with images and videos of what their life is. We don't really know what I mean. We know most of social media is fake where people can be deeply depressed, but to put on a face that their life is perfect, but that's because it's a story they're telling, they're projecting. So from our waking moments, we're either consuming other stories, whether that's on social media, reading books, television, movies, or talking. When we talk to people, what are we doing right now? You and I are exchanging in some ways, stories, parables. You telling yours, I tell mine, where it's back and forth consumption of storytelling. And that's all I really, it's all humans do 24 seven is storytelling. And I, we, we learn from that. There's a lot to be gleaned from a story. You can tell the principles of how to be morally right or upright. But then when you layer that in with a character that has to deal in a situation where his morals and you put him in a situation where he has to exercise those morals and principles, then you get to see how it plays out. And that's what novels and fiction does is you, you give characters situations that we may or may not have been in. And then we kind of fantasize, like you were saying, you're picturing yourself when you're reading the end in the shoes of those characters. And could, how could you deal with that? That's the power of storytelling Yeah, is you're not just reading it for, as I said, when I was writing that and when I've written my other books, it's not just for entertainment. I want people to think I put the characters in situations. I want the reader to go, what would I do now? Now you've taken a step further than, than just being entertained. You're role playing how you would be, how would you act, how you, how you would act that, that can even, I've had so many people over the years. That carries even further past that. Well, people will literally take lessons from the fiction because they saw what happened when a character made a bad decision and then they got the horrible consequence of that. Like, I'm not having that happen. Look, look what happened to so and so, G. Michael Hobbs' book. I'm not doing, I'm going to prepare for this. I've had so many people read my books that turned around and became more prepared minded people because of how they saw some of the characters faring and not faring. So, the storytelling was is entertaining. It was informative. It was, and then even enriched their lives because they took lessons, positive lessons from the interactions and the situations the characters dealt with. So w- without a doubt, and I think nonfiction can be difficult. It depends on what it is. Like some history or biographies are pretty good. If you've got, yep. if you've got a good writer writing them, then they can be, they can be, well, because a, a, a biography can be good or an autobiography can be good because you're telling someone's life, which is a story. Yeah. Right, and that's really all a biography is. It's just a story. I mean, how much of it's really true, we don't know. But the world—they're not—they're t- not telling every time they're going to take a dump. So that we're we're getting the highlight reel of their life, right? Essentially, yeah. what it is. Um, and so, I mean, there's some nonfiction that's really good. I'm, I always go back to Stephen Ambrose. I think he was a brilliant historian. He was. Uh, I think the way he he the way he kind of wrote his you know Undaunted Courage was a brilliant book about the the core of discovery. You know uh, the Mary, uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, and the way he, the way he told that story, the way he conveyed it was a mix of the log books from Meriwether Lewis and um, 
uh, it was just brilliant. He was just, again, he had a way of weaving the words that was, you were also entertained in reading history. It wasn't dry. Uh, so I, I guess it really depends on what you're reading from a nonfiction standpoint. But I, I know a lot of people, actually, I'm, I'm running into a lot of people that are pretty accomplished individuals, entrepreneurs, business owners. They actually do both. They're kind of hybrid readers like yourself. Like I am, I'll read nonfiction, but I also like to, I also like to get into fiction, I like to get into, you know, read some good hard hitting stuff, some Jack Carr stuff, you know, or, to, or pick Carr up this Ross. or pick up that. Yeah. I mean, just like, it's good stuff, right? It's just good stuff. And so, but then, you know, it's kind of, you kind of intermixing it. It's like, you know, you watch some documentaries on TV and then let me just watch a TV show. Let's just be entertained for a little bit, not really think too much. No, I think um, what you said right now is bang on and entrepreneurs really ought to um, take the time to read books that are fiction as well as nonfiction. I'm not against reading nonfiction. I read a lot of nonfiction, but I believe very strongly that you should also read fiction. And these high-level gurus that proclaim proudly, I never read any fiction. I don't have time for that fluffy stuff. Well, that fluffy stuff isn't fluffy. That that is all about touching you at the deepest recesses of your soul and bringing something magnificent out as a result. And that's what I love about oh. your books. And that's what I love about reading the best fiction out there, 100%. And it resonates, and it resonates across generations. Look at, at um, George Orwell. We don't, yeah. we don't refer, whenever we see some kind of dystopian, kind of nightmare authoritarian movement happening, do we recall some kind of nonfiction book from the 1930s? No, we recall George Orwell's 1984. Yeah. Because what he's doing is he's painting a, a grim dystopian authoritarian image of the future, which in some regards is not 100% has come true. And so, you know, was, you know now, now you like, was he, just a, was he just a storyteller entertainer or was he kind of a prophet? Was he foretelling kind of, you know? And in many ways, yeah, from a human existence, we always have a tendency to lean toward authoritarianism after a period of time. It's what we do as human beings. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can look at there's there's these, these deep examinations that fiction gives deep examinations of individual of these characters and their flaws or their positive traits and what they do. Like I just um, I just picked up again um, The Great Gatsby from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. Fantastic book. You're getting this really deep examination of who this guy was. And were, you know, uh, here's a man who um, you know, came from nothing. And because of love, he oh, actually, even before he ended up meeting Daisy, he was determined to not be impoverished anymore. And he, and if you, if you, if you're familiar with the book, he, he actually had this diary Gatsby did. And he had this diary and he had this, he had the things that we talk about today, these life hacks. He was doing these life hacks to get the character for himself. Like, get up every day at this time, do these exercises, you know, think about this, Re read so much of the dictionary, read so much, like he was, here was a character that, and you, and you can be inspired from Gatsby. You know, a guy who was born impoverished, who, who rose to the ranks of the most richest people in record time, because he opened his mind to learning. He put, he took great risks, you know, and, so yeah, you can be inspired from a character. Like, look what he did. I'm going to follow. I'm going to do it. It's fictional. The guy doesn't even exist. He embodies a lot of people that are successful, come from meager beginnings and end up becoming highly successful. That's all Gatsby was, but he was an inspiration. He is an inspiration as a character to people that can model that today. And that's fiction. And it's also, you take the positive traits because this is the human component and this is the beauty of, of fiction and, you're looking at the positive trait that Gatsby, but yet he had this flaw, this flaw. And he was such a romantic, he could not get over Daisy Buchanan. He couldn't. And it was his downfall eventually. So here's this great man had come and had, had gone through all this adversity, but yet he had this one flaw. He couldn't let her go. He couldn't let her go. Yeah. And it destroyed him. It consumed him and then destroyed him. So, and then you look at that as like, I don't want to be like that. Look what happened to him. He, he died because of it. So, I mean, it's an extreme kind of showcase, but it, there's lessons to be learned in that. And that's what these great storytellers are doing. So, Yeah. The best storytellers give you the lessons you need in life. Yeah. And while totally. I believe there's a lot to be learned from a lot of great nonfiction books, Ed Milet, for example, just wrote a book I read called uh, Power of One More. Fantastic book. Really, really got a lot out of it. 
Uh, I think that people that preach staying away from stories and staying away from from good fiction and reading books are making a mistake. Uh, in this day and age, a lot of people get caught up in watching streaming services and Netflix binging, and I've been guilty of that as much as anybody. But if you sit down with a book, a good book written by a great writer, it has the power to transform your life. There's a lot more to it than simple entertainment. And that's why I wanted to bring you on the show. That's the main point I wanted to make. Why fiction ennobles the soul. You know, that'll be what I'll entitle this particular episode. And um, God bless you for coming on. God bless you for writing the book. And uh, please uh, come on the men's podcast and let's uh, let's have you talk about uh, the book to that audience too. And that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. To find out more about today's guest, go to the show notes at thethoughtleaderrevolution.com or wherever you happen to listen to this podcast episode, be it Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or our friends at Audible. Until next time, goodbye. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.